Welcome to our video, Japan and the World. The topic for this time is, Keir Starmer's Britain, can the center hold? Brexit Britain fell deeply into the turmoil of 21st century populism. Yet it appeared in summer 2024 that the center would hold. I would like to focus on the commentary by Dana H. Allen, editor of Survival, Global Politics and Strategy and a senior fellow at the IISS. Based in London, he is also adjunct professor of European Studies at the SAIS Bologna Centre in Italy. Britain in early July 2024 was cliché-soaked. Rain plagued Wimbledon. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak had already gotten theatrically drenched on the 22nd of May. Standing outside 10 Downing Street to call an election that his conservatives were sure to lose. It rained six weeks later on the 5th of July, the morning after polling day. On that morning, a BBC News presenter felt it necessary to explain to viewers that the crowds getting wet outside of Buckingham Palace were regular tourists waiting for the changing of the guard. It is possible that most did not even notice the successive motorcades that sped past them, the first containing Sunak to offer his resignation to King Charles. The second carrying Labour Party leader Keir Starmer to accept the King's invitation to form a new government. I confess to some ambivalence about the monarchical pomp that contributed, in the past decade, with accelerating absurdity, to an English exceptionalism driving a deluded Brexit. On the 5th of July, however, with the gyres of democracy spinning out of control across the Atlantic in America and, so it seemed at the time, across the English Channel in France, Britain's constitutional rituals were not just comforting they framed a political succession of banal, and therefore somehow bracing, conservatism. I am hardly the first to observe that Britain since its 2016 referendum threw away one of its enduring, intangible assets, small-c conservatism. In pursuit of the chimeric, sunlit uplands of Brexit, the Tory populist revolution devoured its children, five prime ministers in eight years, each one more ideologically frivolous than the last. Until Sunak tried to calm things down with a degree of technocratic normality. Yet even Sunak was driven by the populist furies to the grotesque stunt of trying to deport asylum seekers to Rwanda. For one post-Brexit phase, this circus was mirrored in the Jeremy Corbyn-led Labour Party, with its own ideological caprice including a sinister streak of anti-Semitism. Starmer was Corbyn's deputy leader, a human rights lawyer and then state prosecutor who only entered politics in his fifties. Starmer performed a balancing act that was both conventionally political and forthrightly humane. He stood by the left-wing Corbyn but at the same time gave voice to outrage at the anti-Semitism that Corbyn tolerated, if not encouraged. Cognitive dissonance must sometimes be managed. And Starmer managed it well. Soon after taking the helm, he expelled Corbyn from the party. Labour had spent much of the late 20th century battling Trotskyites and other radicals in its midst while producing mainly serious-minded leaders and prime ministers. Neil Kinnock, Labour's leader from 1983 to 1992, won that battle against the militant tendency, decisively enough to pave the way for Tony Blair's new Labour and, by extension, Starmer's solemn manifesto centering on national renewal and mission-driven government. Whatever else happens, Labour turned itself into a plausible party of government. The astonishing speed of passage from Corbyn's epic defeat by Boris Johnson in 2019 to Starmer's landslide victory in 2024 attests to that accomplishment. Starmer's conservatism is most evident in his current position on Britain and the European Union. While Corbyn's ambivalence about EU membership, an artifact of leftist attitudes from the 1970s, was arguably a significant factor in the referendum result, Starmer was an unambivalent remainer. 
Yet in the recent campaign he stated that the United Kingdom would not rejoin even the European single market in his lifetime. He has, to be sure, promised to negotiate closer trading relations and much closer cooperation with the EU in the context of countering Russian aggression across many domains. The caution is nonetheless striking and perhaps odd. Britain's government finances are dire, its social and physical infrastructure decayed. The new government has promised continued fiscal conservatism, relying on economic growth to pull the country out of its hole. In these circumstances, rejoining the single market would seem to be akin to picking up a 20-pound note off the floor. Polls show, moreover, that over 60% of Britons now believe that Brexit was a mistake. So Labour's current position looks, on one level, unimaginative and even cowardly. On another, Starmer may simply see wisdom in the judgment of Tory grandee Kenneth Clark. A committed Europhile who nevertheless concluded during the endless parliamentary turmoil after 2016 that there was no stable future for Britain inside the EU. Clark for this reason opposed holding a second referendum. By this reasoning, for all the harm inflicted by the Brexit revolution, counter-revolution would inflict more harm. The Organization of Choice The Conservative Party's Brexit obsession damaged Britain immensely, in the first instance by raising barriers with its nearest and largest economic partners. But also by ripping apart an organic, semi-constitutional relationship, which also encompassed foreign and security policy. For at least a decade, moreover, Brexit has been the central polarizing issue of British politics and culture, animating a version of the culture wars that have so sharply divided America. It is ominous indeed to hear the feckless former Prime Minister Liz Truss echoing Trumpian language of a deep state that conspired to wreck her record short term of office. Perhaps, though, Starmer conservatism can also calm this bitterness. While it would be too much to say that Britain feels comfortable in its multi-ethnic skin, it was genuinely moving to hear Sunak. In his resignation speech, relate with pride the remarkable cultural milestone of his daughter's lighting Diwali candles at Downing Street. So far, the UK culture wars have not seriously threatened Britain's own constitutional norms or the rule of law. As UK journalist Nick Cohen noted, writing in his Substack column, this distinguishes British conservatives from American Republicans. However much there is to say against the British Conservative Party, and I have said most of it, it is not an anti-democratic movement. We had the blessing of a peaceful handover of power on Friday morning. Rishi Sunak did not follow Donald Trump and deny the results of a legitimate election. His supporters did not storm Parliament. The Conservatives are right-wing while the Republicans are far-right-wing. I do not use that label out of leftish rhetorical excess. It is a simple statement of fact to describe as far-right, extreme Conservatives who do not accept democratic rules. Brexit Britain fell pretty deeply into the turmoil of 21st century populism yet it could be said in summer 2024 that the centre was holding. This appeared even more impressively true in France, where Marine Le Pen's seemingly ascendant Rassemblement National, national rally in English, came first in the first round of snap parliamentary elections called by President Emmanuel Macron, but then fell to third behind a leftist alliance and Macron's own centrist formation in the second round. That second round occurred three days after Britain's election. So Europe in the course of a week had the happy experience of political establishments in two leading countries managing to organize a choice that offered its voters real democracy while walling off extremism. In the French case, this was accomplished through a somewhat haphazard version of an old tradition, a Republican front against what are still deemed off-limits strains of fascism. France's drama isn't over, as Catherine Fieschi details elsewhere in these pages. Both countries face severe difficulties. 
but they have been or should be able to form governments on the basis of a liberal consensus and, critically at this juncture, a determination to defend liberal values against Russia in Ukraine and elsewhere. America's Cold Civil War. This brings us to America, magnitudes more important for that defense. The American paradox is of a country more comfortably multi-ethnic than Britain. With a stronger economy and the unquestionable wherewithal to help defend Ukraine for as long as it takes, yet paralyzed by a cold civil war. On 12 July, at a Donald Trump rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, a 20-year-old gunman shot at and came very close to assassinating the former president. The attempt did not, in and of itself, fit easily into that narrative of civil conflict. The attack by a registered Republican did not seem overtly political or ideological. Except insofar as lonely young men immersed in gun culture form a recognizable and perhaps faintly ideological subculture with menacing and, in endless mass killings, deadly implications. Yet the June 1968 assassination of Robert Kennedy by an angry Palestinian, the April 1968 assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. by a white racist. And even the November 1963 assassination of John F. Kennedy by a U.S. Marine Corps veteran who had spent time in the Soviet Union all seemed more clearly political. Moreover, as the New York Times historian columnist Jamel Bowie and others have observed, the current moment is hardly among the most politically violent periods in even recent American history. As Bowie also says, however, that comparison does not capture the febrile fear and sense of impending political doom on both sides of an angrily polarized America. The Cold Civil War is a consequence of near-even electoral division and the firm conviction on both sides that electoral outcomes are existential. Trump's virality and a MAGA movement that has swallowed the Republican Party leads Robert Kagan, a prominent past neoconservative who is now firmly anti-Republican, to warn against a preemptive submission to an already forming Trumpian dictatorship. From the opposite direction, in ways that I admittedly find hard to fathom or explain, Republicans echo the warning of Michael Anton, a National Security Council staffer in the Trump administration. Anton wrote in 2016 that the prospective election of Hillary Clinton represented a threat to America comparable to that of the 9-11 hijackers on United Airlines Flight 93 so dire that the only option was to storm the cockpit, even if it meant death for everyone on board. Three days after the attempt on his life, Trump chose as his running mate Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, who had just claimed that the Biden campaign's anti-Trump rhetoric had incited the attack. Financial Times columnist Ed Luce noted the irony that between Vance and Biden, only Vance had once directly compared Trump to Adolf Hitler. But Vance has since developed into an articulate voice of MAGA radicalism at home and Trumpian neo-isolationism abroad. Particularly critical of Biden's support for Ukraine and NATO. Whatever Trump is offering, abroad and at home, is not conservative. In this he is an authentic avatar of the American right. On the 1st of July, the U.S. Supreme Court, shaped critically by the three justices Trump appointed, decided that presidents have presumptive immunity for all official acts. Though prosecutors can overcome that presumption if they can show that charges related to official acts would not intrude on the authority and functions of the executive branch. They remanded the U.S. Department of Justice's case against Trump to the trial court to weed out those official acts before proceeding to try him on charges, if there are any left, related to his attempt to reverse the results of the 2020 election. It is difficult to avoid the conclusion that this Supreme Court is a political actor determined to re-empower a former president whom juries have found civilly liable for sexual abuse and defamation, and criminally liable for campaign finance fraud.
and whom common sense indicates is guilty of trying to overthrow the American Republic. In the same week that the court seemed to validate a lawless presidency, it also appeared intent on uprooting entrenched standards of early 20th century progressivism and mid 20th century New Dealism, coded by MAGA as the administrative state. As in Britain, the conservative alternative in the United States comes from the center left. As I write, however, the Democratic Party is in crisis because of the ineluctable and hardly unforeseen reality that its presumptive nominee, President Joe Biden, is old and getting older. An abysmal Biden debate performance, the performance of an old man, has sparked panic among Democrats and Trump fearing foreign allies. Yet there is a clear anti MAGA plurality, if not majority. In the United States, perhaps the stolid determination of Keir Starmer is a model to which American elites could turn to frame the choice that their centrist country seems to want. That's all. Keir Starmer's Britain, can the center hold? Brexit Britain fell deeply into the turmoil of 21st century populism, yet it appeared in summer 2024 that the center would hold. Commentary by Dana H. Allen, editor of Survival. Global Politics and Strategy and a Senior Fellow at the IISS, based in London. He is also Adjunct Professor of European Studies at the SAIS Bologna Centre in Italy.